Right, hi guys, welcome. Welcome to Forking Allotment, and today I'm going to be doing a bit on um, how to deter or uh, control pests in our gardens. So hopefully this will uh, help a few people out. Um, currently upstairs in the bedroom at the moment, because I think somebody's going to be using the dining room, so I didn't want to start off too late. I know I'm a bit, little bit late, four minutes late at the moment, but... Just give me a second and I'll just shut this door. Right. So, yeah, what we're doing is talking about deterring pests in our gardens. Hello, hello. Or uh, controlling pests in our gardens. As I said, I'm in the, in the uh, bedroom at the moment. Um, somebody's going to be using the dining room, so um, hopefully they'll be finished soon and I'll be able to use the uh, dining room. In a second, so I can get a bit more. So, not much better on light there. Right, we'll start off. We'll carry on with this then. So, uh, right. So, as we talked about last week, we talked about companion planting. Um, today I'm going to talk about a little bit more about sort of um, how we can deter pests um, by basically organic methods, really, by using companion planting or by... Um, trying to get uh, other bugs, beneficial predatory bugs into our gardens. So, hello Rachel Jane, hello. And hello Family Gardener and Thrifty. Sorry, I didn't say hello to you there. So, what I was gonna say was, um, we can use different types of um, plants to basically help us to control pests in the garden um, as well as sort of more harsher measures if you're not doing uh, organic gardening. But what we can do is we can basically try and get um, predatory insects into our gardens. Hey Dojo. So we get, try and get some predatory insects into our garden by um, by using companion planting, basically, or by giving them somewhere to live, basically. So, as you may have learned, obviously, from my previous previous live, um, and if any of you are on Instagram, you've been following my um, my posts and stuff on Instagram um, about companion planting. Then, um, as you will have learned. Um, there are many different types of companion plants um, and they're great for keeping pests down whether they actually repel the pests themselves or whether they attract beneficial insects to your garden. Um, obviously pests are one of the biggest problems that we have because they can actually destroy a crop um, if you're not careful. Though, as I say, there are many chemical sprays on the market that you could use, but a lot of people tend to prefer to um, avoid using these chemical sprays. Um, but I'm not going to get into a debate about organic versus non-organic. Um, but if you are going to use an organic method, companion planting is um, a brilliant way to reduce the need for chemicals in the garden. So... Uh, with companion planting, it's a case of learning what works in your area. Different plants work together in different types of soils and locations. Plants can be extremely good at deterring pests, but you must remember that some will take time to build up the protection. Um, chives will protect against apple scab, but it can take up to three years before they provide full protection. Uh, you can also you also need to remember that once the infestation has occurred, 
companion planting may not provide a complete solution because there are too many pests. So they're better off as a preventative measure rather than a measure to get rid of pests that are already there. Um, so planting onions next to your cabbages will protect against cabbage moth. Um, it will, sorry. It will work if the onions are planted first. But planting the onions after the cabbage moths have taken up residence won't provide you with many benefits because they're already there. There will be some years where pest infestations can be more serious um, and pest populations tend to fluctuate uh, with them being lower in some years and higher in other years. Companion planting will provide some assistance but may not provide a complete solution. It also depends on what people are growing near your vegetable plot. So if your neighbours kindly grow lots of plants that attract pests, then you may find a higher, normal, higher than normal pest population on your vegetable plot. Hello Wick and Chicken Homestead. Hello. Thank you for coming along from the USA. And you may, yeah, you may find higher than normal populations in your vegetable garden if people are growing plants that attract pests nearby, which obviously if, if you're on an allotment, People are going to be growing possibly the same vegetables that you're growing. Therefore, you will be probably more likely to get a lot more pests because everybody's growing in the same sort of area. So they're going to be they're going to be drawn to that area. Um, but you may alternatively, again, your neighbours may be growing plants that attract beneficial insects. Um, which is obviously very helpful. So there are some insects that you want in your garden. Wicked Chicken says ready for the warmer weather. Yeah, we've had really nice April here. It's been really nice, really good. Um, we've had like sort of 15 degrees plus. I think it was 20 degrees today and it's April. So we've had a bit of a weird April, but so yeah, there are some insects that you want to in attract to your garden. This includes uh, parasitic wasps, uh, which feed on grubs, caterpillars and aphids. Lace, fin lace wing larvae, which feast on aphids. Ground beetles, which feed on a variety of ground based pests including slugs and snails. Uh, hoverflies, which feed on many different insects, including caterpillars and leaf hoppers. Ladybird, ladybird larvae, which feed on aphids. And robberflies, which feed on insects such as leaf hoppers and caterpillars. Uh, one of the keys to successful pest control is diverse planting with your uh, companion planting. So covering your vegetable plot with onions in the hope that it will control pests probably won't work. You need a variety of plants. Um, even a variety of companion plants that attract the same type of insect for it to be truly effective. As well as this, the plants will need to be effective at attracting beneficial insects. Um, sorry, throughout the growing season. Uh, if your companion plant flowers in June and starts to die back at the end of the month, they're probably not going to provide any protection from July onwards. <coughs> Successional planting can help, obviously. Yes, praying mantis feed on pests too, but uh, we're in the UK, we don't get many praying mantises here, so... <laughs> So one common mistake that people will make with companion planting um, is that they think that planting a lot of the same thing will help with the different, um, will help to deter all, the, all of the insects, but it's not going to help. You need to be diverse in planting. 
So make sure that your cho chosen plant also flowers, um, is flowering and enables you to cover the whole of the vegetable, the whole of the time that your vegetable crop is going to be at risk from pests. Um, if not, those insects are trying to, you're trying to attack will go elsewhere when they need them, when you need them the most. Uh, although beneficial insects will eat pests, there are times their life, in their life cycle when they do not. At these times, you need, so they need somewhere else to live and food such as nectar or pollen. Providing in, the essentials for all stages of the beneficial insect's lifespan means that you, they will take up residence in your garden for longer. Um, which provides you a greater protection and more protection. Um, so a hedgerow or pile of fallen logs can help provide a perfect home for most beneficial insects. Uh, early season flowers can provide much needed nourishment for their young um, and keeping and therefore keeping the insects near your vegetable plot. Um, if you want a hedgerow but are concerned about the lack of productivity of the lack of productivity of one, grow a hedgerow of fruit trees. Um, either use dwarf or patio varieties and train your plants to grow in step over or espelier forms along wires. So what do beneficial insects need? So beneficial insects, basically they need some, some beneficial insects will need all, most of these main four things, really. They'll need ground cover, um, low growing plants, such as mint, rosemary and thyme provide a cover for all sorts of ground beetles. Um, Hiding in these plants provides them with protection from predators so they can live out their lives hunting pests for you. Uh, shade. So a shady protected area is important for laying eggs. Um, some people will have a wild or slightly wild area in their garden specifically for beneficial insects. Um, tiny flowers. Many of the predatory wasps are very small and need small flowers to attract them. Um, so anything sort of like fennel, dill, coriander, clover or yarrow sort of along those lines would be good for these those insects. Um, and then composite flowers. So larger flowers such as chamomile and daisy are great for attracting wobberflies, um, predatory wasps and hoverflies. Uh, um, any member of the mint family also helps. So we can use herbs, obviously we've talked about this before, we use herbs to deter pests. So, um, some of the most commonly found pests and the companion plants that traditionally repel them. So, ants. If we have ants in our garden, we can use catnip, mint, any type of mint, um, tansy or wormwood. Aphids, we can use catnip, chives, coriander, um, or cilantro for you American peoples. Uh, chrysanthemum, dried and crushed. Eucalyptus. Uh, fennel, feverfew, which is best planted near roses to attract aphids. You attract the aphids to the feverfew, not the roses. Um, and garlic, marigold, uh, mint, mustard, nasturtiums. Um, onions and oregano. There's quite a lot that keeps aphids away and quite a lot of them will be compatible with different plants as well so you can work out which ones are compatible with which plants. Um, asparagus beetles. So these only attack the asparagus plant and they are kept at bay by basil, pot marigolds and calendula um, or calendula however you pronounce it, um, nasturtiums, parsley tansy and tomatoes. Uh, bean beetles. These are kept at bay by marigolds, nasturtiums, rosemary and sa summer savoury. Black flea, la uh, black flea, be flea beetles are kept at bay by sage. Cabbage looper. You can use dill, eucalyptus, garlic or hyssops to get rid of these. Uh, and also, sorry, mint, peppermint or spearmint. Uh, nasturtium, onions, 
sage, thyme and wormwood. Uh, cabbage maggot are kept at bay by garlic, marigold, radishes, sage or wood wormwood. Cabbage moths can be kept at bay by hyssop, mint, oregano, rosemary, sage, summer savoury, tansy or thyme. Um, cabbage worm, celery, thyme and tomatoes. Carrot fly. So with carrot fly, we can we can stop the carrots from going the, the sorry carrot fly from going to the carrots by planting them with onions. Um, the carrot fly don't like the smell of the onion, um, and I think also the onion fly don't like the smell of the carrots. So it's actually double. It works both ways. So we can we, sorry we can plant with carrots. We can plant any of the alliums, um, onion family, lettuces, rosemary, sage. Tobacco, be aware this is illegal to grow in some areas, and wormwood. Colorado potato beetles, we can use catnip, coriander, cilantro, sorry, coriander or cilantro, eucalyptus, marigolds, nasturtiums, onions and tansy. Um, and corn ear worm. Cosmos, geraniums and marigolds, just keep them away. Cucumber beetles, we can use catnip, marigold and nasturtiums, radishes and tansy. Flea beetles can be kept at bay by catnip, steeped in water and used as a spray. Um, garlic, mint, ruse, sage, tansy, uh, tobacco and wormwood. Flies don't like basil, rue, any rue or um, tansy. Japanese flea beetles can be kept at bay by catnip, chives, garlic, hydrangea, pansy, rue or tansy. Leaf hoppers don't like chrysanthemums, dried, dried and crushed, geraniums or petunias. Mexican bean beetles can be kept at bay by marigolds, petunias, rosemary and summer savoury. You can keep mice away with tansy and wormwood and you can keep mosquitoes away by garlic, geraniums and rosemary. Oh. Right. So moths can be kept away with lavender, rosemary and wormwood. A peach borer doesn't like garlic. Nematodes can be kept at bay by marigolds. This takes a year for the chemicals to build up in the soil. Um, and pot marigolds, same, same thing. Uh, onion fly don't like garlic. Slugs and snails can be kept at bay by fennel, garlic, rosemary and sage. Spider mites can be kept away for, by, by using coriander or cilantro for you Americans guys. Squash bugs don't like catnip, mint, nasturtiums, petunias, radishes or tansy. Squash vine borers can be kept away with radishes. Striped cucumber beetles can be kept away with tansy. Striped pumpkin beetles don't like nasturtiums. And ticks don't like garlic or lavender. Tomato hornworms can be kept away with borage, calendula, um, pot marigolds. Dill, marigold, or petunia. Hello, Ashley White. Good evening. Cabbage, um, white cabbage moth can be kept away with mint, and white flies can be kept away with basil, marigold, oregano, peppermint, and thyme. What thyme? So there's quite a lot of different things you can use against different pests. So how can we get beneficial insects into our gardens? So we can do we can get beneficial insects in by providing the best living conditions for them. So some of the common most commonly found beneficial insects um and I'll give you some information on what they like to eat and what they environment they provide they they prefer sorry. So ladybirds these are carnivorous 
um, and a feed on green and black aphids, as well as red spider mites. So organic growers, organic growers and gardens, gardeners love them. Trying to attract them into your gar into your gardens, their gardens. Every year, ladybirds um, will lay hundreds of eggs. The larvae will eat thousands of aphids before maturing, hence the importance of providing a habitat for them throughout their life cycle. Um, typically, a ladybird will live for up to three years as long as it avoids being eaten by other predators. Um, there are several plants that attract ladybirds, including tansy, fennel, dill, um, cinquefoil, yarrow, elysiums, penstemon, Oh, sorry, and penstemon. Uh, ladybirds feed on most, some of the common garden pests. So they will feed on aphids, Colorado potato beetles, fleas, mites, and whitefly. Um, the next one is spiders. Now, obviously, a lot of people don't like spiders, uh, and it's understandable. I don't, I don't like them that much myself. Um, but, however, they are really useful in the garden. Um, they eat a lot of different pests and spiders will find natural home in your garden but you can attract more to your vegetable plot. Um, spiders can be attracted to your garden with a number of plants and environments. Taller plants attract web weaving spiders um, which will catch more flying insects, some aphids and grasshoppers. Predatory spiders like somewhere dark to hide and enjoy mulches for that reason. Um, they will hunt many different pests, including caterpillars, grasshoppers, and aphids. Ground beetles. Now, ground beetles. These are your best friends in the garden. They're voracious predators. Um, but they, and they particularly they will eat quite a lot of different things. But they're particularly fond of slugs and snails. Um, although they wouldn't get invited to any uh, dinner parties due to their uh, eating habits. Um, basically, they vomit on their prey and then their digestive enzymes start to dissolve their food. Um, ground beetles are often killed by beer traps put down for slugs um, as they will walk along and just fall into them. So if you make sure if you do have beer traps for slugs as well um, you can use them make sure that there's a lip around the beer trap um, which will stop the ground, ground beetles from falling into the beer traps. Um, Most ground beetles are nocturnal. Um, they need somewhere shady to hide during the day. A pile of stones or logs um, or some leaf litter will give them a good place to hide. Um, out, to hide out during the day um, and keep out of the sun. Like they don't, obviously, they, as I say, they're nocturnal. They don't be out during the daytime. Uh, ground beetles are att attracted to your garden by several plants, including clover, amaranthus and evening primrose. Um, ground beetles will dine on many pests, including slugs and snails, cutworms, Colorado potato beetles, and caterpillars. Um, these are definitely worth protecting and looking after in your garden because they will help to keep pest levels down naturally. So now we need parasitic wasps, and to cause brachanoid wasps. These are very dis different from wasps that bother a lot of gardeners. Um, they tend to be smaller and will not sting you, unlike their bigger, more voracious, more vicious cousins. Um, the life cycle of these wasps is considered to be a little gruesome. Um, they benefit your garden in helping control pest levels. They, basically, this wasp will lay its eggs in a host insect. Um, once the eggs hatch, the larvae will eat the host alive, then emerge as an adult. Um, this family of wasp, wasps hunt many different pests, including caterpillars, ants, aphids, and sawflies. Um, parasitic wasps can be purchased and introduced to your garden. Just be aware any local regulations that may affect their introduction. Um, and tell your neighbour you're doing so, so you don't accidentally, accidentally kill off. They don't accidentally kill off your garden, new, new garden helpers. A wide variety of plants can attract parasitic, parasitic wasps, including yarrow, dill, parsley, lemon balm, lobelia, marigolds, 
um, Cosmos, Alysiums and Synchrofoil. They prey on a lot of different destructive insects, including aphids, caterpillars, um, tomato hornworm and tobacco hornworm. So another great insect to attract to your garden is a damsel bugs. Um, they're not fussy eaters and they'll prey on pretty much in any insect that um, causes problems in your garden. Um, they live in no, in Europe. They live in orchards where they eat gypsy moths and red spider mites. This will, this insect will overwinter in vegetation and appreciate somewhere to hide out between meals. Although damsel bugs can bite, their bite isn't poisonous and tends to have no effect other than minor irritation to the victim. Um, they can occasionally eat leaves, but do not usually to the extent that causes crop damage. Providing there is sufficient prey for them, they are unlikely to touch your vegetable crops. Damsel bugs are attacked at your garden by alfalfa, fennel, caraway or spearmint. They eat a lot of common garden pests including aphids, cabbage worms, caterpillars, corn earworms, leaf hoppers, potato beetles and spider mites. By growing some ground cover and low hanging plants, um, you can attract damsel bugs into your garden where they can help control pests. If you don't expect them to be there, <laughs> feed yourself. I love you. <laughs> Both, baby. And then next we've got green lace wings. These are particularly attractive insects that are common in British gardens. Their delicate lace wings, lacy wings, can be forgiven for thinking these innocent little creatures um, are of no use to your garden. But don't be fooled by their looks. These are voracious predators um, in both adult and larvae forms and will eat a vast amount of insect eggs and aphids. The larvae have large jaws which interlock and make pincers in on their prey interlock to make pincers on which they prey is impaled um, the larvae are very good at clearing your garden of soft body pests lace wings are attracted to your garden by several different plants including angelica coriander cosmos sorry coriander cosmos dandelion dill fennel and yarrow um, some of the insects eaten by lace wings include Aphids, caterpillars, leaf hoppers, mealybugs, and white flies. Any soft bodied insect, basically. So, soldier beetles. Both adults and larvae are useful in pest control. The female lays her egg in the soil where they overwinter, um, pupating in the spring. Um, therefore, they need you need to leave some area of soil undisturbed over winter so the eggs can mature. Soldier beetles also eat pollen, so pollen bearing plants can help attract them into your garden. Uh, anything like goldenrod, marigolds, milkweed, wild lettuce or zinnias. Uh, they like to prey on aphids, caterpillars, corn root worms, cucumber beetles and grasshopper eggs. Uh, they're interesting to look at and will help to keep pests under control as well. Um, tachinid flies. So adult tachinid flies closely resemble a typical house fly um, and are so are often mistaken for them. These are a parasitic insect that lays its eggs inside the host insect. Basically pretty much like a parasitic wasp. Um, either eggs or live young are placed inside the host insect where they lay eat, where they eat, then eat the way out um, some species will lay eggs on plants where the host insects live which will then hatch and eat them these insects love flowering plants such as anything in the dill or aster family um, you may see caterpillars on your plants with white eggs on the backs on their backs tachinid flies have attacked these and the eggs will soon hatch and bury their way into the host 
Technoflies can be brought into your garden by using anything like asters, buckwheat, Sorry. carrots, cilantro or coriander, chamomile, dill, fennel, feverfew, parsley or ox eye and shasta daisies. They prey on lots of different pests including caterpillars, Colorado potato beetles, corn earworms, cutworms, earwigs, gypsy moths, Japanese beetles, Mexican bean beetles, sawfly beetles and squash bugs. And then hoverflies. These are frequently confused with wasps. Um, they share the same black and yellow colouring, but they do not sting. They also hover, which wasps do not. Um, they do not have long antennae and are typically smaller than stinging wasps. There are lots of different species of hoverfly and they can fly as fast as 40 kilometers in short bursts, 40 kilometers per hour in short bursts. The adult hoverfly will feed on pollen and nectar, so it's larvae will, which is larvae we're particularly interested in. These are voracious predators and feed on a wide variety of garden pests, including aphids. They will not only assist in pollination, but their young keep pest populations down. So you can attract hoverflies into your garden by using elysiums, cosmos, dill, lemon balm, um, mallow, marigolds and yarrow. Pretty much anything, also pretty much I found pretty much anything with a yellow or um, orange flower usually works. Hoverfly larvae prey on a lot, quite a lot of different pests, but mainly aphids, caterpillars and scale insects. Uh, then you've got predatory mites. These like humid environments. So they, you may find them inside polytunnels or greenhouses. Pardon me. Um, where they will, they will prey on spider mites. Um, spider mites can be a serious problem in greenhouses and are hard to control. So if you can get these predatory mites into your greenhouse. Hello conversation, Jed. Ross, how are you? Um... Predatory mites can find their way into your greenhouse, but more often people buy these beneficial insects and introduce them into the environment. Now, when there are no spider mites for them to feast on, um, they will feed on pollen from your plants, thus helping with pollination. Next one is solitary bees. These are a species that, sorry, there are lots of species of solitary bees. Um, which do not live in colonies, choosing to live by itself instead. In Britain alone, there are 20, 200 different species of sol solitary bee. I'm good, thank you, uh, Ross. How are you? Um, sorry. I'm good, thank you. I haven't been up to much recently. I saw your video. Uh, I'll watch it after this. It literally just come up just before I was coming on. just going to come online. Um, Sorry, there are over 200 different species of solitary bee in the UK, including the mason, masonry bee, which is often mistaken for a hornet or a wasp. Uh, these bees can look like wasps or honeybees, but they are no threat to you whatsoever. Uh, the females dig nests, which can then be stocked with food, nectar and, nectar and pollen, and sealed. The young are left to fend for themselves. These bees will usually nest underground, um, often being found under sheds and piles of logs and so on. You can help encourage them into your garden by making an insect hotel. Okay, I'll have a look at that video afterwards, Russ, and I'll see what you, what you mean. Um, right, where are we? These are vital pollinators and they're encouraged into your garden with flowering plants such as catnip, Fuchsia, heather, lavender, marjoram, or verburnum. Um, so now you know some of the beneficial insects that we can attract to our gardens um, and what they will feast on. Um, so we can do different things, obviously, to, to uh, attract these beneficial insects or to make them feel more at home when they do come to our gardens. Um, things such as providing a, a like a bug hotel, which a solitary bee would like to live in, or by um, leaving a part of ground undisturbed, uh, so that some different uh, bugs can um, 
basically make their nests there. Um, or a dark, dank corner for a spider to hide. Um, a lot of us probably have these dark, dank areas where a spider would like to uh, inhabit underneath, underneath our sheds. Or quite, quite often find them in our sheds, spiders. Um, but they are very good for our gardens. So next time you see a spider, don't just squish it. Think about it, what it could be doing for your garden. So as I say, different insects, as I say, with, different insects do like different places to live. Um, I found last year that hoverflies loved to live inside my polytunnel. Um, to the point where there were hundreds of hoverflies inside my polytunnel. So you can make things like bug hotels or um, anything like that. You can just make, um, we've talked about this before, putting like... Um, dry pieces of uh, grass which are hollow um, bits of uh, bark and tree stumps uh, tree stumps with holes drilled inside into them and stuff like that um, so basically we can make a bug hotel um, and it's basically made out of recycled um, things and all that So you can use, as I say, you can use drilled wood, which solitary bees and predatory wasps will be attracted to. Um, and they will crawl inside there and then lay their eggs. Um, rotting logs, wood boring beetles will make their homes here um, and their larvae will eat through the wood. This level, this level should be at the bottom of your bug hotel um, so that the logs remain damp mix in some other plant mat matter which will decay attracting wood lice millipedes and centipedes the latter of which will eat slugs um, spiders will also make their homes here you can use twigs and sticks which bundled together provide a nice home for ground beetles um, ladybirds will also take up residence as will hoverflies Bamboo canes, hollow stems provide great home for solitary bees um, and they will lay their eggs in the bamboo and seal up the hole behind them. Straw or rolled up cardboard, this is a great home for lace wings. So put it in the end of some, some in the end of an empty plastic bottle, cut one end off first to prevent getting soggy and unattractive as a home. Um, and then it will attract the, the uh, bugs to the hotel, to that part of the bug hotel. And say like lace wings and stuff like that. Uh, bug hotels are a great idea to build and can be a fun project for children as well to get involved in. However, you need to put it somewhere that in, the insects can get to. It needs to be in a sheltered part of your vegetable garden, away from constant human traffic. Um... Place it near a hedge pond or f your flower garden because that's where they'll be most likely to be happy because um, they'll be they'll have all around them that they need. So other beneficial creatures. So if we build a small wildlife pond, we can attract frogs into the garden. Um, now frogs, toads and lizards and snakes, um, getting them into your garden they can help to uh, keep down the, the, the uh, bugs. Well, frogs and toads love to feast on snails and slugs. Um, and if you can get snakes, depending on where you are in the world and how big the snakes are, they may keep down um, rodent problems as well. So obviously be careful if you're in like places where there are poisonous snakes because you just need to be careful you don't get bitten by the snakes as well. Um, some people let ducks, geese, geese or chicken loose on their gardens and now forage for slugs and snails um, and stuff like that which they like. And you also get fresh eggs from ducks and geese and chickens as well so there's an upside as well. Uh, just make sure that the chickens don't eat your plants because they will. Uh, when attracting wild animals into your garden, avoid feeding them directly. Uh, first is, firstly, this can encourage them to get into trouble by approaching other humans. 
um, who may not appreciate them as much as you do. Secondly, it can reduce the ability to survive on their own as they become dependent on you for food. Um, also, avoid the use of pesticides or herbicides in your garden if you are trying to attract wild animals into the garden. But um, yeah, just try not to uh, feed, hand feed them sort of thing. So, also crop rotation can help us with um, keeping our um, pests at bay and diseases. Because obviously, like, like we say, things with, um, there's different things like, um, oh, sorry. Hello, Carl. Uh, there's different things that we can be uh, looking at that um, with crop rotation. Um, it helps to stop a build-up of diseases in the soil, such as things like um, like club root and that in, uh, in brassicas and stuff like that. So if we are rotating our crops every year, therefore then we want to be rotating our um companion plants also um you will have some perennial crops like your rhubarb and um asparagus that don't fit into any crop rotation plan they will be in a permanent bed um so you just need to keep an eye on them really to make sure that they're going to be kept healthy and stuff like that because they will be in the same bed so obviously there is an option obviously there's a a chance there that they're going to be um, subjected to uh, different diseases and stuff like that because they are in the same bed every year but the rest of your plants you want to um, try and rotate them every year so you don't grow the same crop in the same place each year and um, it also improves soil fertility it's good for weed control um, and it obviously gets um, rid of, it can help to control pests and diseases. So yeah, you'd have like three beds where you'd have different plants in each. So you'd have like brassicas, potatoes, and then you'd have bed three, which would have your legumes, peas and beans, basically, onions and root crops. And then you would rotate that. So then bed one would become your legumes, onions and root crops. Bed two would bed two would become your brassicas. Bed three would become your potatoes. And then the following year, bed one would be potatoes. Bed two would be your legumes, onions and root crops. And bed three would be your brassicas. I think I said that wrong. No, I didn't. Yeah, so that was how it, that's sort of how it would work. Um, and then you'd have like you can do these either three or four. Um, I've seen people do a five year rotations as well, um, but sometimes I feel that a five year rotation is probably too much. Um, but then, I mean, you wouldn't have the same veg in a bed in one bed for five years, so that may work for you in some some way or another. Um, Myself, I would use a four bed, four bed rotation. So I would have brassicas, legumes, and then roots, and um, then potatoes in another bed. Um, and then you can have a fourth bed. No, that's four beds. Fifth bed, which is like your um, either random stuff, or sorry, my hands are holding the camera. Uh, either like just random sort of stuff or like uh, um, you could do like a a, um, a bed for night, nightshade type plants, which would be obviously potatoes come in that, but also uh, you could put peppers, uh, aubergines, and tomatoes in there as well. So you also there are some beneficial weeds as well. But we also want to be, be checking that these are beneficial and they're not going to um, be bad for our gardens. And also we want to keep them maybe in a certain area if we're going to use weeds for 
beneficial. So we've got broadleaf plantain. It's the most common weed found across Europe and North America. Um, it is used for medicinal herb properties, perhaps best known as a soldier's herb, as it was used to dress wounds. Um, it accumulates several micronutrients, including magnesium, iron, manganese, calcium, sulfur and iron, all of which will benefit your vegetables. Um, allowing plantain to die back naturally or dig it into the soil, you can cut the leaves monthly if you prefer them as a mulch. Sorry, if you prefer and use them as a mulch. The plantain will in most cases grow back, but at the end of the season, dig in the roots and leave leave in leaves for a maximum benefit. Chickweed. This almost this almost grows almost everywhere. Sorry. Um, but usually it's an indication of soil with poor fertility. Um, chickweed is an edible plant being treated like lettuce and also has medicinal properties. If you leave chickweed to die back on its own for the best results or cut the leaves regularly for a mulch. Um, cutting leaves and flowers will mean it doesn't attract many pollinators. Dig this into the ground at the end of the season so nutrients are absorbed back into the soil. Lamb's quarters. This is common in poor soil and used to improve the quality of it. Um, the deep roots of the lamb's quarters accumulate many vital nutrients including calcium, magnesium, sorry, calcium, manganese, potassium, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, the roots will loosen up the soil, helping break up tough soil. Um, treat this weed like the previous two to benefit your soil, so just dig it in leaves and all. White clover. Now, this is commonly used as a green manure, um, but is also found virtually anywhere as a wild herb. It grows happily in most almost any soil, um, though it loves clay. Digging clover into clay soil will help the condition of the soil and improve it. Um, it is commonly found in soil that is low in nitrogen. Clover fixes nitrogen into the soil as well as accumulating phosphorus. It attracts a wide variety of predatory insects, including ladybirds, um, Sorry, including ladybirds. As well as this, it attracts plenty of pollinating insects and provides shelter for spiders and ground beetles and parasitoid, parasitoid wasps. And lacewings will lay their eggs in the white clover. Um, all in all, it's a very useful plant, even though it is a weed. Use white clover in the same way as the previous weeds. It will grow... It will grow rampantly, so there are plenty of options for transplanting or gathering seeds to propagate it. Just make sure to keep it under control, as it will take over if left to run wild. Dandelion. This is one of the most common weeds in our gardens. Everybody's probably got dandelions in their gardens somewhere. Um, And can be considered, it can be considered a real pest of a plant. Um, yet you can make wine out of the flowers. You can eat the leaves and make coffee and beer from the roots. Um, it's commonly found in hard clay soils, which will, loosen, which will loosen up as it grows. Dandelions accumulate a variety of minerals, including calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, silicon, potassium and phosphorus the growing. You can eat 100% of dandelion in one way or another. They were originally a crop. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was just saying. Yeah, we can eat dandelions some way or another. We can use any part of the dandelion as a um, crop, as a, yeah, basically as a crop. We can use the leaves and salads. We can make wine from the flowers. We can make coffee um, or beer from the roots. So... Pretty much all the whole plant can be used 
in some some way or another to eat. Um, and dandelion, young dandelion shoots um, are actually quite nutritious. So uh, once you, they've finished flowering, you dig the dandelions in. Ding, 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 ding. Dig the dandelions up to remove the roots, being careful not to leave any pieces of root in the soil because they will grow back from a tiny little bit of root. Um, compost the leaves or dig them in to the soil to destroy and destroy the root. Dandelions grow back from even the tiniest piece of root. Um, while they do benefit your soil, they can very easily take over your entire garden if left unchecked. Um, weeds are a fantastic way of naturally improving your soil. Weeds tend to accumulate the minerals in the soil, the minerals that the soil needs. Um, and those with longer roots help to loosen up harder soil. Although weeds like poison ivy are annoying, others like stinging nettles are beneficial. If you want to keep plants under control, then remove the seed heads before they can spread. So basically that is um, how we can control pests in our garden and what we can do um, organically. We don't want to be using any uh, pesticides or anything like that. Um, I know there is, um, you can use like a spray of uh, water, oil and like a organic dish soap. But be aware if you do use that, it may kill or it probably will kill also beneficial insects not just the bad ones that you don't want on your garden um so it's probably better to try and use companion planting like i've said before um, and i will be continuing to do um posts on companion planting on my instagram so guys if you're not subscribed to my instagram there is a link up above and um, there's also a link there to my facebook page and to my um, Twitter up there as well. Uh, but mainly, most of my stuff goes on to my Instagram and my Twitter. Uh, my Instagram and my Facebook page, sorry. Uh, I don't use Twitter all that much. Um, most, most of the stuff I post short posts or I will post uh, like reposts of other people's posts on there. Because the information I want to get across... It doesn't copy well onto onto Twitter because of the um, the amount of characters that you can have on Twitter. Um, so if I post something on Twitter um, that may be linked to either Instagram or to um, Facebook, that would be um, the in information on uh, growing crops um, and basically on um, companion planting. So I have done several... Um, posts on companion planting on instagram and facebook so far and uh, i've received decent feedback on them so um, i will continue to do that um, i'm usually posting about two a day at the moment um, so if you aren't subscribed to me on instagram please do so or if you're not on the facebook page um, please go over to facebook um, there should be a link up above or just check out um, forking allotment on Inst on facebook and um, you'll be able to find us on there um, but yeah, other than that, I think that's pretty much everything for tonight. Um, thank you for coming along anyway. Please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. Uh, and I hope that you've enjoyed the content and uh, we'll talk about some more stuff next week. Uh, hopefully next week I'll get into the dining room um, and get better. Um, sort of a better video maybe. Uh, I'm, as I said, I didn't want to be late on this today. So... Um, other than that, yeah, thank you guys anyway. I shall see you all soon. Um, and please do remember to stay safe. Um, stay indoors if you can. Um, or just stay safe, stay away from people, two metres away from anybody. Um, and if you need to, wear face masks or anything out in public. Um, but yeah, stay safe and stay healthy. And please don't forget that um, we're all human. So, yeah. Right. I shall see you all soon and I'm sure we'll see I'll see I'll, I'll have a video out at some point but yeah see you all later and uh, please do remember to uh, check out my social medias up above thank you and I'll see you all later